You ready? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so hi, Scott. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time to speak with me via Skype. And um, how so ironic well. that we're using digital technology to record our call. Isn't this awesome? <laughs> it's awesome. You, I love it. I love it. It's there, you, great. there you are in Toronto, and here I am in Bismarck, North Dakota. So Yeah, and how's uh, the weather in Bismarck, North Dakota today? It is gorgeous right now, and we are just so blessed that, uh, you know, we, we actually had a mild winter. We are kind of known for our brutal winters. Yeah. And it, <laughs> It's, uh, we actually had no, for no snow for the first time that I can ever remember. I mean, we had, I, I can't even remember how many days it snowed, maybe two. Yeah. Uh, it never really accumulated. So, uh, which was kind of nice because my daughter is 16 and she's driving for the first time. So she actually had a, a, what I call an extended fall to, uh, yes. you know, to yeah, that's keep her, or build her driving experience. <laughs> so now next year she can, drive on the skating rinks that it usually is. So no, it's, it's just wonderful weather. So we are, we're going to take it and run. So go with it. We had the same here in Toronto. It never really, really got uh, cold, which in a way I kind of miss because, you know, in Canada, we like it a little bit cold sometimes. So absolutely. Um, well, you're the land of hockey. So we're the hand, land of hockey and you can't go skating if there's no snow, right? Exactly. <laughs> if it's above zero, then you can't skate. Anyway, let's get down to business. So yeah. digital technology, technology and kids. I know that it's something that you're really, really interested in. And what I'd Absolutely. really like to talk about is maybe a little bit more specifically about the program that you're um, launching within the schools in your area and um, what specifically you're doing about uh, technology in the classroom and uh, some of your ideas. So why don't you tell me a little bit more about it, Scott? Well, the program is called Social Media Students, and it's a project that really uh, came about to help three different audiences. Uh, the first audience will be teachers, yeah. and we're going to help teachers educate students um, how to personally and professionally brand themselves uh, using social media tools like Skype, like Facebook, like Twitter and YouTube, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, we're also going to help parents. We're going to help parents bridge that gap because, uh, as you know, the, the older kids get, you know, once they get beyond that age of 13 and they become teenagers, uh, it gets a little terrifying sometimes to, uh, to understand how they're communicating. And it seems like these kids are always got their face in the phone and, you know, even at the table. And, and this generation sort of gets, uh, has been branded as being this disconnected generation, uh, mm -hmm. by our generation mm -hmm. and, and older generations because they think that they don't know how to have a conversation when in all reality, this upcoming generation, probably one of the most creative generations that has ever lived, the most globally connected generation that's ever lived, and they mm -hmm. probably communicate more than you know we ever did in a, in a lifetime in the span of a week. Mm -hmm. um, you look at the number of texts and and messages that they send to each other; they yeah. are actually communicating more. They're just using a different technology. So so for. We don't understand it, you know, and, and yeah. the parents don't understand this new technology because they're not immersed in it like the kids are. So we want to educate the parents as well. And then, of course, we want to educate the students um, to how to personally and professionally brand themselves. And I say personally and professionally because there is Internet safety out there that you they need to learn and they need to learn etiquette and things like that. But there's also an issue with the professional that – when these kids graduate and they go to look for their jobs using social media like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, yeah. it's not going to be an option anymore. It's going to be a, something as, as critical as phone skills yeah. um, and, and email skills. I mean, it's something that's going to be mandatory because this is the way that businesses now communicate. And then they're going to need to know how to use Skype and they're going to need to know how to use Twitter and, and make these connections. But they also need to know that once they post something online – it's online pretty much forever. You can't ever delete it. Yeah. And so, you know, we really look at that as uh, the reason this came about. You know, I, I mean, I look at if a kid wants a driver's license, it's mandatory that they take a written and practical examination. And we yeah. do that for two reasons. One is to protect the, the kids and, and, and make sure that they're safe, but also to protect the other people on the road as well. So these kids aren't running red lights or swerving across the line and causing accidents and things. The, or, or what about if they want to go hunting or if they want to obtain a license to get a gun? They have to go through a hunter safety course, at least they do here in North Dakota. And it's mandatory and they have to take a written and practical exam, again, for their safety and the safety of other people. So... so 
so so if I can just step back a little bit because you you yeah. um you've touched upon a few topics and items that I'd like to really investigate a little bit further. Absolutely. So one of them is the personal branding that you um, addressed. The other one is safety. So let's go back to the branding aspect. So you're okay. talking about now the option of perhaps teaching parents through the educational system um, to have a curriculum that includes how to brand yourself online yes. uh, via social media. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? So how would a, a teenager and why would a teenager want to brand themselves? And how early should this type of program start? So how old should the children be before they start this program? Well, actually, the goal is to start this program. Um, I would like to see this started in schools from ages 13 on up okay. because legally that's when they can have a Facebook account. That's the, the first time that they can legally have. I know that there's kids that have Facebook accounts much younger than 13. Right. I mean, my, my daughter's one of them. But, yeah. I mean, you know, we, we do that to teach them about it. Um, I think that it should be mandatory starting at that age on up and, and show them that, again, everything they post, they are branding themselves. Yeah. Um, they are telling, you know, once they get out of school, I mean, a lot of businesses and a lot of schools now do personal background checks on people before they make the decision to hire. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it just even with the, the whole interaction. We had a, a young girl in North Dakota here actually uh, take her own life. She committed suicide wow. because of Facebook bullying. And I know it happens all over the nation. And, and to me, that's one too many. It's one too and, many, absolutely. And, you know, we had um, – I've been blessed by by finding this 30-second mom group that you guys are uh, mm-hmm. associated with. And, and the, you have the Wednesday night Twitter chats. Mm-hmm. And to talk about the social bullying that happens or even the bullying that happens, I know that was the topic last week. Yes, it was. And it, it's such an important topic to, to discuss that – I think that social media has made bullying um, more accessible. Yes, uh, kids are—it's it's more convenient because they can they can cower behind the anon- anonymity of of the social media account, or they don't have to be necessarily face to face to throw out the the uh, the insults or whatever that may be. So, yeah. and and every time they put it on there, that is on there forever. And because of because it's a network, it filters out. I have seen things that my uh, the friends of my daughters have posted mm-hmm. just because I'm friends with my daughter right. and things will bleed out into my stream. And it's pretty shocking. With, it's a uh, whole some of these viral nature saying. of social media and digital Absolutely. technology in general that the kids need to learn about. So I understand that this is uh, what you do want to teach the kids, which I think is great. Um, now, how much would you suggest that the parents are involved in this type of curricula? What is your, what is your kind of, um, you know, guidelines in terms of how we how we get our parents involved and, and what their feedback is towards what the program's going to look like? Well, I would love to see parents get involved in the discussion um, the whole way. Um, right now, the reason that we're doing – this came about is because uh, there's a lot, a lot of schools in North Dakota right now are banning Facebook and Twitter from school. Okay. Now, and- do you think that it should be banned from school? Absolutely not. In fact, no. I have okay. talked to a lot of the superintendents and 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 uh, superintendents here in Bismarck and Mandan. And when I spoke to them, I you know I really told them that I think that they're doing one of the biggest service to kids in the history of education by banning Facebook and Twitter because these tools are so critical. Again, we're just tossing them the keys to these cars and saying, "You kids figure it out." Mm-hmm. And the parents are too freaked out about social media to actually sit down, learn about it, to teach their kids or to have a discussion. They don't, they don't have the discussion with their kids because they don't understand the tools. They don't use them. And, and there's obviously exceptions to that. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, I think a lot of parents are intimidated by these new tools. They don't like the tools because the kids are using them all the time, even at the dinner table, and so they don't feel like they're part of the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Teachers are actually deleting their Facebook accounts because they don't want to have anything where kids can have private chats with them or they can legally get into problems. So I want to educate teachers and parents at the same time Mm -hmm. how to safely and effectively open up these lines of communication. You know, I love Facebook because at any time I can tell either one of my daughters, I can take five seconds to just type them a quick little note and let them know I'm thinking about you right now. Mm -hmm. You know, or you just made me smile or, hey, I have a question about this. And, and, and it literally has opened up more communication with my daughters. And then when we get home at the end of the day, mm-hmm. 
we are laughing about things that we were saying earlier or, you know, we're continuing the conversation face to face. And so we've actually got a stronger bond. I would love to see parents and and I want to give parents the confidence and the tools to understand the basics enough to where they can get an account, maybe become friends with their kids and, and start that dialogue or at least know enough to have a dialogue about it so that if a kid, they start to see signs that maybe their kid is being bullied um, or there's signs of trouble that they can have open up that discussion with them. Well, you know, I have to say I I completely agree with you uh, in the respect that parents should know what their children are doing online. And if there is a method by which the parents can um, have that relationship with their children online, then absolutely I support that. My question to you, and I'm going to play devil's advocate, is that a lot of parents are going to say to you, Scott, okay, how is this going to work, Facebook in the classroom? They all have laptops or they have their smartphones or their iPads. They pull up Facebook and then all of a sudden they're disconnected from what the teacher is trying to teach um, via the classroom. So are you talking about a specific class about Facebook proper? And if that's the case, what would that look like? And if you're talking about just a general class, such as you know a math class, for example, should kids be allowed to have their Facebook page open? And how would that work? So I'd like, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. It's just like any technology within school, you know, and kids have access to computers at school, but there are times and places for that. I know that right. kids just can't have a laptop open at any time or, you know, they can't have their cell phones. There are times for that. Um, I think that there's, there's two trains of thought with the training that mm-hmm. yes, you actually have some curriculum that is Facebook 101, Twitter 101, you teach them how to use the tools. But then you integrate those tools in with the training. For example, using Twitter, you know, you might say to in a history class, how would have Thomas Edison tweeted to the world that he had just invented the light bulb? And keep in mind, you have 140 characters, including spaces, (laughs) and the world doesn't know what a light bulb is. Or you can flip it around on a test and say, here's a tweet, you know, and, and give 140 characters. Who would have tweeted this in history? Yeah. You know, Good point. and so yeah. it's that I always look at the, the fact that we look at like Lewis and Clark in North Dakota. Lewis and Clark is big because part of their journey came right up through, you know, the North Dakota plains. Right. And I look at the millions of dollars and millions of man hours that have gone into trying to figure out what actually happened on that journey. Could you imagine if Lewis and Clark would have had a blog? Or if they'd have had a Twitter really account yeah. or Instagram, yeah. I mean, it would be amazing. So what's happening nowadays is these kids are leaving digital footprints yes, they behind. Are. And we mm-hmm. all are leaving digital footprints behind. So Absolutely. showing these kids that let's take something in the news or let's go back and reenact. Mm-hmm. What would Lewis and Clark have tweeted along the way? Or let's create some blog posts that they would have created. And let's blog as Lewis and Clark. Mm-hmm. Instead of writing a book report, let's do a YouTube report. Right. And, and, you know, actually reenact some of the stuff that's going on. So but what you're I think saying really sh- is really integrating all of the, the tools that we have now via technology into the curricula of the classroom. Absolutely. Because when these tools become second nature, then all of a sudden when they graduate and they move into the business world. Yeah. It's second nature. They've been communicating with these tools and it just, they don't even have to think about it. It's not something that, it just becomes a part of the way that they communicate. Right. And now we have an entire generation that expects stuff on Twitter and Facebook and yes, YouTube they do. and yes, knows they do. how to deliver it. So yeah. it, you, you are building for the future and, and training with that curriculum to say, Here's how you use it. Here's how you can integrate it in. It's not just something that you tell people, I'm standing in line at Starbucks to get coffee. You know, it's just, here's how people would have communicated. Yeah. Here's how we can leave behind our legacy. Everything that we tweet, in fact, uh, in the Library of Congress, they, they archive every single tweet now in the oh, Library really? of Congress. That's interesting. Absolutely. I didn't know that. That's really interesting. Yeah. Well, and, and think about it from a news perspective. You know, look at, look at things like 9-11. Mm-hmm. You know, um, if if there would have been Twitter when 9-11 happened, can you imagine? They've done psychological studies around the world to see how that impacted different communities. Yeah. And, you know, when, when Osama bin Laden was uh, killed, we averaged, there was a Twitter record, they were averaging 5,000 tweets a second for four wow. and a half sustained hours. That's unbelievable. You know? That's how the world communicated. That's yes, how we get our news now. So to start to integrate that into the classroom and, and, and even start to create you know, relationships with some of the authors. If you're reading a book, 
start tweeting with the author mm-hmm. as a class. You know, you might even set up a class Twitter account. Right. And tweet to this author and even invite them to come in and do what you and I are doing right now and have yeah. a Skype conversation. They could actually bring these authors into the class for five minutes. Yeah. And the kids could actually ask these authors the point blank questions. Yeah. You know, I think it's so, wonderful. I mean, I think technology has really brought us to a different level of learning and a, no a different level of potential for our kids. Now, what I'd like to know really at this point is how do you see this rolling out? So, you know, the theory is great. And I think that, um, you know, I'm in agreement that technology used properly can really, really support and help our kids learn. But how would you actually implement this uh, rollout of technology in the classroom? Because there's a lot of there's a lot of issues and, and um, variables to this picture. So for example, people are going to talk about access to technology, the haves and the have nots. Are we setting up a situation whereby, you know, certain school boards that have uh, more money that are more affluent will be able to support a curricula that is uh, more engaged with technology as opposed to other uh, school boards that might not perhaps have that technology and that money. And also yep. the student base. I mean, we have to look at the population within those specific techno- within yep. those specific um, areas. And if we're looking at certain um, 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 groups of people within a, a school section that don't have as much money, you're going to run upon the situation whereby people are going to say, well, because these people live in this particular school zone, they have access to better education, better technology. Yeah. And just by virtue of the fact that these people over here are perhaps less affluent, they will not yeah. um, have access. So now how are you going to reconcile that? Because you know that that's going to be a question that people are going to ask. Absolutely. And, and it's obviously it's going to take a, you know, we're, we're at the point now where we're just starting to put these ideas together and yeah. even just getting the curriculum approved, approved so that it's a standard that which can be graded. Yes. Um, you know, that, that's a whole discussion that has to happen. We have the, the superintendents are definitely interested in sitting down and, and talking about this and they're interested in getting this training in. So in the meantime, while we're trying to figure out all of those questions that you just asked, we want to put together some tools that teachers can use right now, mm-hmm. um, put together some blogs and resources that they can access online and if they have the means and, and talk about how not every kid in the room needs a laptop or a mm-hmm. smartphone, you can have most classrooms now have some sort of a smart board or have some sort of a computer and, you know, or access to a computer in the school. Maybe they go down to the computer lab. Right. But if they start to slowly integrate this in, I think that it's going to s- start to take off. But those are all great questions and all definitely have to be addressed. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't think that it'll hinder the fact that it's still needed. You know, I mean, we have to figure those things out. And when you look at it, even in some of the less affluent neighborhoods, you know, even people on welfare have yeah. smartphones. They have cell yeah. phones. It's just the one thing that, that you even see uh, regardless. I, you know, you see people, um, you know, the, they just that's the one accessory you know, in life. It's that, a slippery slope because, you know, people are going to say, well, if you're collecting public assistance, why do you have a smartphone and why are you paying for, you know, oh. this plan with this particular service provider? Exactly. And, you know, I'm not going to say whether that's good or bad, but you know that that's going to be the natural progression of, of conversation, right? Oh, absolutely. So, it's, it's one that already yeah. is existing. And, yeah. you know, and to me, it's like that that's their decision. But the fact that I, you still see it, you know, that yes, it's the, the technology is where we touch our lives and. You know, kids right now, I think on average, are spending about seven hours a day, seven days a week on some sort of media, whether it's mm-hmm. television, games, uh, Facebook, you know, computers, whatever. So mm-hmm. it's one of those where we have to start to address that. Yes. You know, it's it's the same as they started to teach uh, sexual sex education in schools. Yes. And they added that as part of the health because, you know, teaching kids about condoms and, and things like that in, in, in safe sex because – it would just became such a big part of their society that, you know what, the school has to take it. They're the primary caregivers. They actually see those kids more than the parents see the kids because they're again, with them eight know, hours it, It's day. along the same lines where, you know, that, that is um, a controversial um, aspect of, of teaching for a lot of people because a lot yep. of people would say, no, it's not the school's um, role to do that. It's the parents' role. Now, whether or not, irrespective of what side of the fence you're on or I'm on, it doesn't really matter. Yep. But you know that it, that same argument is going to be used in terms of technology, right? 
right? So people just like sex education, people are going to say, no, it's not the role of the school to teach my kids sex education. That's my role. And um, accordingly, I feel the same way about technology. I want to be able to control what my kids do. Now, you know, I do have to say from a personal point of view, I agree that, you know, it's very hard to do that because, you know, I go by the schools. I mean, my daughter who's eight, she doesn't have a cell phone, but a lot of the kids at her school do. She goes to a school that goes up to grade eight. And a lot of those kids who are, you know, 10, 11, they all have cell phones. I see them walking up and down with cell phones. I see some kids going to school with iPads, you know, so it's everywhere. And um, we definitely have to adapt regardless of what our point of view is. So I think that it's, it's a discussion that's going to keep going on because you're always going to have people on those two sides of the fence. And absolutely. Yeah. And both those voices need to be heard and addressed. So uh, we have to have, you know, a format in place for both of them that everybody feels, feels happy with the outcome. Absolutely. Well, I, and I just love what you're doing. And I mean, I, what inspired me to take this even further was the fact that I found the 32nd Mom Group oh, I'm so um, glad. and, and saw, <laughs> saw your blog, saw what you're writing about in technology and parents and just said, you know, this. I, I had this idea for a long time. I've probably been th- dreaming about this social media students idea for a year. And when I saw what, the, what you are all doing with con- building that content and making it convenient, and making it mobile and making it accessible, oh, yeah. that's what really sparked the conversations that we have had that mm-hmm. – this is probably the platform and the group to to help launch this, you know, mm-hmm. e- worldwide. And so, you know, it, it doesn't matter to me who who does it or how it gets done. The fact yeah. is that it needs to be done, and it's just something that I'm passionate about because I'm invested in it. I, I I'm a social media consultant for my profession, but yeah. I have two kids that I care about deeply, and this you know, I want to protect them in. and their friends. And yeah. and I've watched. You know, we've had some very frank discussions recently about posts that have been made and and how feelings have been hurt and things like that. So we talk about that and and I show them, look, this one post all of a sudden escalated out and look at how many people are affected, not just kids, but the parents. And it's crazy how volatile that can get. And so they need to understand that because they have a global audience with every post, they have to, you know, with, with. Great power comes great responsibility. Absolutely. You know, that's a great line from the movies, right? It is, but, and it's uh, true. That, it is absolutely true. And so we just want to teach these kids that, you know, hey, just a heads up, you know, mm-hmm. that you can do what you want. You've been warned that, you know, you may it may be fun to to be belligerent and, and have your fun online, which yeah. you think is fun. But, boy, it could cost you someday because that kid that you're bullying is probably going to be your boss someday. He's going to be a not CEO. Your boss. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I or think not you. It's, it's it's an it's a topic that is is age old. The fact that children don't think that they'll ever grow up and they think they're yeah. immortal and they think that their actions don't have any repercussions. And that's just the norm. That's normal for a young child to not be able to have that foresight and to see into the future. And us yes. as parents, we all have to teach our kids that, you know, what you do now, like anything is going to have some repercussions later. So, um, Thankfully, when I was a kid and a teenager, they didn't have YouTube and, you know, online because, you know, we've all done very stupid things when we're teenagers and and young people. But the problem now is that uh, it's recorded forever and people can share it on YouTube and on their blogs and on Twitter and they can tweet it out to everybody and on Facebook. So we definitely need to have some type of a structure to teach our children what's appropriate and I think, you know, one of the most salient points from this discussion and that we need to spread out there to all parents is that what you put online, regardless of where it is, is there forever. And that includes email. People think think emails are private. And I guess they are to a certain degree, but people can forward emails. People can copy and paste emails. People can take emails. Yeah, people can take screen grabs of, you know, a chat that you've done. And, you know, these are all things that people need to um, understand, especially young people. I I see kids doing things and, you know, I definitely educate my my eight-year-old. I tell her, you know, you know, being online is a privilege, but you have to be very, very careful about what you do. Not only the sites that are out there that are completely inappropriate for children and wrong, but also what they say and what, you know, we, we have all these cases Sadly, of people being bullied uh, to the point where, you know, as you mentioned before, people, children committing suicide because of YouTube bullying. I mean, that's that's horrible. That's absolutely horrible. So we definitely need to talk about it. It's definitely um, a topic that needs to be addressed. So on a lighter note, so tell me, um, tell me quickly about 
your program, what it's called, where people can find out about it, um, if you have a website for it, and all the details that people can look into it further. And I will post it on my blog as part of this blog post as well. Well, we are going to call it Social Media Students yeah. for now. That's the working title. We do have a, a website, socialmediastudents.com. We haven't put any content. We're still in the very early stages of building this uh, curriculum, building the, the programs. We've done some speeches already out there. Uh, we will be putting some videos online. Um, yeah. and We've gone around and done some some talks with parents that we will be putting some of those notes and then I will be creating some videos uh, that just sort of go through some of the initial talking points. Mm -hmm. um, we went around to some churches even and did some, you know, free one hour come, come and talk about social right. media and your kids. And they were packed, oh, you know, because right. parents really, really care about this yes, and they're they really do. worried about yeah. it. And I think what you talked about just a little bit ago that, you know, when we were growing up in high school, you know, like five years ago. <laughs> they, uh... <laughs> yeah, it was only a couple of years ago for me. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. <laughs> We did not have the luxury of leaving digital footprints behind. Thankfully. Our our good and the bad that we did, you know, thank goodness, right? Yeah. So, uh, but nowadays that's not the case anymore. No. And so we don't understand. We can't fathom the fact that everything these kids are doing is traceable and yeah. the forensics behind it. You know, if a kid thinks that they're being anonymous, there's no such thing as anonymous, no anonymous online. Yeah, because yeah. of the MAC address of this computer, exactly. the, the the feds can they could find out exactly what computer you were sitting at and at I what think, time. What and I phone. think a lot of kids think they're anonymous because they might log into a site and make up a fake name and a fake address, and they don't understand yeah. anything about IP addresses. They yeah, and MAC, you know, so that should be part of the 101 about an IP address. Nobody is anonymous online. Well, in IP addresses can even be spoofed, you know, yeah. and I could spoof to look like I'm somewhere else. Like but the server. MAC address, yeah. which is the yeah. physical address of the yeah. computer that on the chip, that cannot be Absolutely. spoofed. Yeah. And so that, you know, the kids don't realize that when you send an email out or, you know, that, that it does bounce through nine servers before it gets to the yes, destination. It and it's sitting on nine servers. And, and it's hosted on a server elsewhere, not in your computer. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So. Yeah. There, there's no such thing as anonymous. It's just important. I mean, so there, we're working on the websites right now. We're working on those the social presence. And I think that, you know, the more that you and I have some discussions, we yes. talked about getting the 30 Second Moms very involved. So mm -hmm. this may morph into something completely different. But right now the intention is to uh, create the initial content and get teachers having this discussion and having the need mm -hmm. and, and maybe dropping their guard a little bit about these tools instead yeah. of banning them in the schools to maybe say, you know, I know that they can't just flip the switch overnight and say, okay, now let's have Facebook and Twitter in the classroom and you can use it. It's going to take some time and a process, but we have to start that process because if the longer we wait, the, the generations from now until it gets launched are at risk. Yeah, so yeah. we got to get some stuff out there in a hurry that at least mm -hmm. parents or teachers can grab and at least have a conversation included in, you know, part of the, their, their curriculum or start to talk about it. And I know yeah. there's, there's plenty of stuff out there about the safety and, and I know that net smarts and things like that have great content and videos on bullying and, in internet safety, I want to really start addressing the professional side of it as well because that's right. going to affect them later on. So that's yeah, the one yeah. piece I think that is missing from the puzzle. Yes. Well, I think it's fabulous what you're doing. So, again, tell Thank us you. where we can find you. What's your website and where can people look up uh, what you're doing, all the great, wonderful things you're doing? Well, my website is wildinspire.com, W-I-L-D-I-N-S-P-I-R-E.com. Uh, they can find out all the information about the product. We'll have banners once it's ready. And then the, the project is called Social Media Students. You can find me on Twitter at Wild Inspire. Yeah. And uh, on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Wild Inspire. So, Wonderful. I, and I will yeah. make sure to put that as part of my blog. And I, I ask all of my blog uh, readers to follow Scott because he's a fabulous guy and we've had some great discussions. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm really I, looking forward to what you're doing with the social media students. I think it's a fabulous idea. Thank you. No problem. Well, thanks very much, Scott, for talking to me today, and uh, we'll be in touch 